Oh, I don't yeah. see anything. Hello, everybody. My name is Mao Gosha. I'm a marine mammal trainer at the Vancouver Aquarium, and I work with Stellar Sea Lions, Northern Fur Seals, and David. And today, I will be um, talking about my trip to California in March of 2015, where I was helping with rescues of the stranded California sea lions. So the problem, where? In California, like I said, mostly between the counties of Santa Barbara and San Diego, there were hundreds and hundreds of starving, dehydrated, malnourished, and sick sea lion pups washing ashore. There was such alarming number of them that NOAA declared it an unusual mortality event. Um, suspended reasons for the, suspected reasons for the stranding was El Nino. Um, you all are aware what El Nino is, so I'll say it in my understanding. So there is warm winds from the south that are not counterbalanced by cold winds from the north. Water temperature rise from, rose from between half to two degrees Celsius, and that has pushed good fish like anchovies further away from the, from the areas where sea lions feed. So the mothers who gave birth to their pups, instead of going and foraging for two, three days, leaving that unattended pub on the island, had to go further and further away to find prey, and they would leave the pups for eight to even nine days unattended. And those little pups were starved, they were frustrated, they started going into the sea without any ability to either forage for themselves or actually even eat if they caught something. And they got um, weak, um, malnourished, and started washing ashore. That, that's the basic mechanic behind this. Uh, numbers, uh, in 2011, I'm quoting Noah on this one, so pretty accurate numbers. In 2011, there were 82 um, sea lions pups stranded. In California, 2013 was when Noah announced the first unusual mortality event, 1200, over 1,200 animals. <laughs> and now get ready. 2015, 3,340 animals stranded up till June 1st of 2015. Uh, you may wonder, will this hurt the California sea lion population? Um, the scientists don't think so. The, the California sea lion population is estimated at 300,000 animals. So this is barely over a percent of the population. So even though it's so horrible, it will probably not affect the population of the wild animals. NOAA asked three um, rescue centers in California, in Salsalito, San Pedro, and Laguna Beach, to assist with the California sea lion strandings. And I got a chance to go to Laguna Beach um, uh, location, and you can see it on the picture. The red barn is where the rooms for indoor sea lions were, basically the sea lions that were too weak to do anything else than lay down and not die. And the side pools were for the animals that were stronger enough to go in the water and could get out of the pool. The pools in front of the building are the pre-release pools where the sea lions were housed permanently before the release. And that's where they were competing for the food that was delivered into that pool. So that was the best pool. Lots of noise. Um, rescue stages, um, intake. On intake, you go to the beach, you pick up the sea lion, bring it to the rescue center. Immediately, the vet team assesses the condition of the animal, the weight, the heart rate, and whether or not to euthanize it on a spot. Unfortunately, there was a cutoff weight at the bottom as well. If the animal was less than 17 pounds, it would be euthanized right away, surely because the number of sea lions coming into the place um, that sea lion would take up a spot that you could rescue three other sea lions who were slightly higher at the start, um, um, at the start weight. And then uh, the sea lion was, if the sea lion was progressing to the next stage, it would be given sub-Q fluids, sub fluids with um, lots of dextrose in it, so basically sugar to boost their energy. And um, we started feeding them. Um, first feeding is a tube feeding, which you need two people. One person is restraining a sea lion. The second person is leading the tube into its stomach and pumping a fish formula, which is made of herring, um, blended herring and Pedialyte. Um, the next stages of feeding, as the animal grows and learns more how to eat, would be force feeding the actual fish. Then the animal, like this one on the picture here, would eat from the bowl. And that was a very exciting moment because this is when they start eating on their own. And the last stage of feeding would be feeder pools, where the animals were delivered few buckets of fish dumped in at the same time, and they had to compete with one another. Obviously, that would happen in a while. There is a school of fish, and you have to compete with other sea lions to get the food in. Throughout the feeding stages, there is also health and development assessments. So every three days, every sea lion would be put on scale and weighted. So we had to know that they're growing at the healthy rate, and of course, you observe the body condition, the skin condition, the energy levels. 
Uh, the facility had 125 animal capacities, so as you can imagine, there was a lot of animals to be observing <laughs> every single day. Um, and then the sweetest part of the rescue was the release, bittersweet, because you kind of get attached to them, even though you shouldn't. Um, and um, they go back to the ocean. Um, the release weights for 2015 were actually slightly lower than the regular season. So in a regular season, the sea lions would be released at 65 pounds, uh, which is 25 kilos. And in 2015, because of the, again, the volume of animals, they wanted the animals to go faster. So they were releasing them at 22 kilograms. Uh, trainers to the rescue. So I had this amazing opportunity from the Vancouver Aquarium that I got to go and help out with um, the rescue efforts. Four trainers and six vet techs from the Vancouver Aquarium headed down south and we helped. We volunteered our times over there. Um, there were trainers and um, you may know this girl, that's Andrea. She's a pathologist from the East Coast. And um, a lot of scientists, trainers, vet techs headed down there and we all put the boots on, rolled up the sleeves and we all did the same. We helped rescue those pups. There was no task too small or too big for us, really. Um, on location, daily duties, daily duties. <laughs> there was three things you did. You cleaned, you cleaned, and then you prepped food. And that was basically 12 hours every single day of this. But those were amazing learning opportunities, especially for me, I felt. I learned how to restrain a sea lion by myself using just a towel. Um, I got to go to a rescue and pick up an animal on location. I assisted in tagging of an animal pre-release. And I also got to uh, observe a necropsy, which for me was super educational. This is what, um, how you carry a rest um, restrained sea lion. So you wrap it nicely in a towel and you carry it just like this. <laughs> And um, how does this compare to being a trainer? It's totally opposite of what I do. So like I said, I should not have atta get attached to the animals because you don't want to build a relationship. You don't want the animals to get used to you. You want them to avoid humans because that's how they should act in the nature. They should not be coming up to us and expect any sort of interaction. Um, the question is, is the crisis over? So the sea lions are not stranding anymore at this point. However, Guadalupe fur seals are. And northern fur seals, they have over 80 northern fur seals in the rescue centers right now, and they still keep washing ashore for suspected same reasons. And um, for more information, you can always visit marinemammalcenter.org, and um, they will talk, um, they talk about how you can help with the crisis and how you can help to spread the word and help with the actual rescue. So thank you. Any questions for Malgoja? So the question is how malnourished were the pups? Um, so um, a healthy sea lion pup from San Miguel Island at three months of age is about 17 kilos. The pups that were washing ashore were, were from, they were washing ashore from January but they were from the breeding season of the previous summer. So at seven months old, they were between eight to 12 kilograms. So they were below the birth weight. So super, super skinny. Yes. Uh, so the, the question is if, if there were other um, reasons for emaciation than just um, being stranded, right? Um, so, um, because from the necropsy, actually, that I got to observe, the veterinarian told us that some of the animals he observed had parasites that are found in the grass. So they were actually going to areas where they're not supposed to be going. So not sitting on a sandy beach, but going inland and getting parasites that were found in the grass and they had it in their lungs and that would kill them as well. Well, they should, at that age, they shouldn't be inland that much. They should be still on that um, island where they were born, basically, because they're, they're not traveling with mothers yet at that age. Yes. So the question is about the survivab survivability. <laughs> English is not my first language, um, of the animals, uh, they assess it at 50% at this point. So the way you look at it, 3,000 stranded, 3,000 could have died, 50% of them got to live. 
some of the animals were equipped with GPS tags and they actually are being tracked and confirmed still alive. Yeah. One more question. Um, I, a question was if females were affected as much as males? Adult females. Adult females, we had, I was there for a week and we had one intake of an adult animal that was about two years old and was malnourished. And out of 124 that were at the facility were pups. Great, thank you. Thank you.